to join us for this special welcome event for the Perkies 40 Girls Company. And um, it's an amazing undertaking and ensemble and to have the creative engine to this premier performance here with us at First Works at RISD in Providence is, is just a, a really special honor. First Works is all about connecting art with audiences and whether it's in the 30 public schools we work with across Rhode Island or in community centers or theaters across the state, um, that is our raison d'etre. So um, tonight is possible and actually this whole residency thanks to a special partnership with RISD. And I'm really delighted to be working with them on two of our new Frontier series performances. Of course, Kirkies, and also with the voice of Venezuela on uh, Sunday, March 18th. So I think you all are here knowing that there is a very special performance on Wednesday evening at the RISD Auditorium. Um, I wanted to invite, ask our partner, Dan Kavicki, who is Associate Provost at RISD and a longtime partner, collaborator, contributor to First Works in, in his you know, many realms as a scholar, musicologist. Um, but this iteration is as a partner. So yeah, we, thanks for having us. We've had fun. We've, we've had fun. Had fun. Um, uh, yeah, it's a real uh, honor uh, to welcome you all uh, to RISD tonight for this creative conversation um, and, and community dinner. Food is coming. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, I think, um, it's a really special event for me because I have been involved with First Works uh, as, uh, as, a, as an individual, as a scholar, and this is really uh, a moment where, um, you know, we're getting to partner uh, as institutions or, or entities. Um, and I just wanted to say that, that this event has uh, involved many at RISD, um, different departments, so uh, History of Art and Visual Culture, Textiles, Film Animation and Video, uh, the RISD Museum, and it is officially uh, sponsored by uh, the Provost's Office as part of its um, social equity and inclusion initiative. So, uh, welcome to everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So we have a, a two-part evening, and um, the second part will be a little more social, and there will be food. But I also wanted to introduce our First Works team, who has been working uh, so hard for close to a year uh, to bring all these events together. And uh, let's see, if you just raise your hands, we have Isabel, Jen, Kathleen. <laughs> Downstairs and joining us, along with the food, uh, will be Koki and Holly. Um, so, and part of my personal team is Jay Kukit, who's my husband, and certainly part of the First Works team. <laughs> um, yeah. And then our board members, if you would raise your hands. So glad to have everybody. <laughs> so this is a, a week-long program. Um, this is a, a very busy tour. Um, our artists came in today from Stowe, Vermont, and some of you joined the Textiles um, special uh, special tour, special talk. Um, that was wonderful. There are six in-school workshops. There are two uh, master classes with RISD students, a community workshop at Providence College, a matinee for over 400 students on Wednesday morning. Don't think too hard about Right. <laughs> so, so it's a busy week that we hope will really inspire our community. Um, this week was made possible with a tremendous collaboration with the Aga Khan Music Initiative, for which we're really grateful. And tonight is possible because of support from Rhode Island Council for the Humanities. So um, thank you for your partnership as well. Today is an opportunity to go deeper into ideas behind the groundbreaking art we will be seeing. And this is titled The Inspiration of Tradition, Central Asian Cool. And Ted Levin, who is the... Sorry. Bells are ringing when I say your name, Ted. Who um, is the... Driver. Driver, <laughs> oh right. <laughs> um, Ted Levin is long known to us for all the ways that, that he 
represents and introduces music and cultures of the world. Um, we know him in Providence uh, as the first executive director for the Silk Road Project. He's a professor at Dartmouth. And there are so many things to say about his books and concerts and recordings and festivals that I'm going to let him introduce himself when the panel starts. And uh, I, I also want to thank uh, our other panelists the filmmaker and artistic director, Saadat Ismailova, I hope I said that right, and Shazad Bashir, who is right here, who is the Aga Khan Professor of Islamic Humanities and Religious Studies at Brown University, and also Katie Fries, who is an ethnomusicology graduate student at Brown. So I think it's going to be a really fascinating conversation, and we look forward to seeing you at dinner and uh, at the performance, but Ted. Great, thanks very much, Kathy. Uh, the, the panel, I have to say, is, is really kind of an excuse to, sh to showcase Saga Ismailova, uh, and our function, we're sort of like the Greek chorus to Saga. We're gonna comment and maybe throw some questions at her, but really what we want to do with this hour is give you a chance to, uh, give her a chance to uh, talk to you about her work, uh, particularly work that's related to the genesis of this project, Kirkus. First of all, you all have to learn how to say it. Put, uh, pretend that you're gargling, uh, and you have to say Kirkus. Okay, there you go, good. Um, yeah, the Turkic languages have that thing back there. But anyway, uh, 40 girls. So, Saudan uh, is, a, is a distinguished filmmaker. Uh, her age belies her accomplishments, achievements. Uh, she started when she was very young. She comes from an artistic family. Her, her father is a well-known uh, filmmaker, cinematographer in Uzbekistan. So she grew up, basically. Uh, with the language of film, around film and around art. We met when she was just out of uh, the, the Film Institute in Tashkent uh, around 2001. And that was when the Aga Khan Music Initiative was just getting underway. Um, I was at that moment sort of segueing out of the Silk Road Project back into teaching at Dartmouth, but also um, serving as a consultant to, the, to this newly founded music initiative uh, founded by His Highness the Aga Khan as part of the uh, Aga Khan Trust for Culture, which in turn is part of the Aga Khan Development Network, which works in, in uh, multi, what we would call, uh, pardon the jargon, but multi-sector development, <coughs> meaning social development, uh, economic development, and cultural development which His Highness the Aga Khan believes is a crucial part of doing development work. Uh, and our, we have the privilege, really, of working in the music initiative to make music and musical revitalization a part of that whole development process. We work in 11 countries uh, in Central Asia, uh, in, including there we work in Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Afghanistan, and now with Kirkuz again in Uzbekistan. Uh, we work also in Pakistan and India, we work in Mali, we work in Egypt, and we work with musicians from Syria, uh, not in Syria at the moment, uh, they're in, in Europe, but we will be going back there when conditions permit. Uh, our work is, is uh, fundamentally educational, uh, and this project is very much a, a project not only in, in creation and imagination, but also in educating the young performers who you'll see, I hope, on Wednesday night at the show, who have been working with, with our team, with Saudad and with the composer, uh, Dmitry Yanovyanovsky, based in Tashkent, uh, with Severine Riem, who's here, uh, who's a choreographer and lighting designer and movement coach who's developed a whole movement language of, of Kirkus. Um, and so the beneficiaries of this work have been the, the young women you see at this table. Uh, they've also benefited from working with uh, uh, master musicians in Central Asia, uh, reviving part of our work 
and the Music Initiative has been revitalizing the Ustad Shagird Institute, institution, uh, uh, tradition, if you will. Ustad Shagird translates as master apprentice or master disciple. And this was the way music, not only music, but any kind of art and artisan work was, was transmitted uh, in, in the Muslim world, in, in, in uh, Central Asia, certainly, and in South Asia, uh, from master to apprentice, not through a formal schooling, but through spending time together and developing uh, both a sense of, 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 of uh, music per se as, a, as a, a, a technique, a genre, a language, but also as a kind of moral entity, uh, a musician as a moral force, learning what it means to be a musician by living with your master and cooking his or her meals, usually his, cleaning the house, doing chores, being a member of the household, and assimilating this whole uh, world of, of uh, art and music. So we've created a kind of modified form of that. They don't actually live with the, the masters, but they, they study with. And one of those masters is, is here, Raushan or his Bible, who's the mother, and that's Raushan. She's from Kazakhstan. She's the mother of, of Tokshan of Kartai, who's uh, learned um, from her mother to play the Kyrgyz Kobiz, and also is a graduate of the uh, Almaty Conservatory. So these musicians are actually pursuing sort of parallel educational careers. On the one hand, they are going to conservatories because they need to be credentialized, and that's how you do it. So they're all in, in either graduates of or in the process of uh, some kind of formal uh, arts education. At the same time, they're doing this Ustad Shagir master apprentice work on the side and, and learning from being in our project. So we're delighted to be here to, to share the work with you that we've done. Uh, and the purpose of, of this hour, uh, as I mentioned, is really to uh, allow you, to give you a chance to become acquainted with Saudat and, and her uh, world of, of film that's rooted in a, just a, an extraordinary quality of both imagination, I would say a marriage of imagination and, and craft, uh, and with a sensibility that, that I find um, always compelling and um, kind of a compass, an artistic compass that she's created. So Sada, please come and show us what you're going to show us and talk to us about how you came up with Perkis and how, how we get to today. Well, and no, but with, with the haunted, right? You want to talk, you want to share this? <coughs> well, um, we have been on the road since, uh, actually we started on 16th of February in Tashkent. And so it's almost a month. We are like me and the girls and all the group is inside of Perkis and uh, working on it every day, like thinking about it overnight, it's, uh, you know, it takes your energy. <laughs> so on the way coming here, I was like, listen, then why don't I show my other work? <laughs> 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 Which has, of course, it has the, my mind, it has my logic, it opens up um, the way I work, the way I research, the way I take a subject, and the way I build the layers uh, to, um, to put together an images basically and the sound. So I thought I'm gonna show you uh, the work I've done, um, I presented in March 2017 in CPH Docs, it's a Copenhagen International Film Festival for, for, um, for experimental cinema and um, uh, it basically deals with the archetype and a totem that I collected while I was making another film. I was collecting the dreams of people following, you know, in Central Asia we have this very long river called Amudarya, Oxus, that starts in the Pamir Mountains. <coughs> it's two and a half thousand kilometers. And it goes down, it crosses, starts in Pamir Mountains, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, Karakal, Pakistan, and then basically dies arriving to the Aral Sea. And I followed collecting uh, dreams of people that they once shared to water. We have this ritual that we share our dreams to water. And it took me around two months and then when I got back uh, home and I started going through the interviews, I found a totem that I never actually knew about. Of course, then it came back from my childhood. Uh, 
uh, and it's a figure of a tiger. Uh, curiously, I never read it in uh, any books of scholars, neither Russian scholars or Western scholars uh, studying the figure of tiger in our culture, which is related not only to spiritual dimension, but also to musical transmission. So here is another bound with the Khatkas, because many elder musicians I spoke with, they were mentioning the figure of a tiger that's very present in their imaginary and in their dreams, that comes and insists that they play music and that they transmit. And this animal is also very, very important for the shamanic rituals. It's the same. So uh, before they become shamans and they start healing people, there is a figure of tiger that appears. So I thought, well, I'm going to probably share my tiger travel rather than Khrkas 40 girls, which is, um, if you like compare why, it's again, I repeat, it's the same logic. It's again working with the collective memory, working with archetypes, working with the very deep um, uh, memory or, um, you know, like invisible, um, invisible spaces that are there while uh, in Central Asia everybody knows the legend of Khrkas, but when you speak to people they say yes we know, but when you say tell me more they are unable. And for me it's the most beautiful part of it because there, what, there is an Im immediate emotion which is courage and proudness and that there were 40 girls. But when you tell them, tell me more, they cannot. They say, so it means that it's such a deep memory, probably transmitted when they are very young, hurt somewhere, you know, I know it from myself, but then we cannot tell more. And that lets your imagination work, and that creates a, a, a very wide field for a research. Starting from history, tales, myths, legends, um, architecture, archaeology, um, history, music, epic stories, literature, you know, so that's the way I normally work. And well, I would like to show you the Hobbit. Um, I could tell a little bit showing the images the way I work. Maybe it's not, not very necessary, right? You could maybe show the film, the film and then we see after that. It's it 20, 22 it. minutes, right?
Kuzarın iyi bir yolsan, sen üstünde durasan, bir de Türkistan geçerliysen, sultanım gel. Peki hayırlı bu işinin kahramiyeti yok deyip sen ayıma gelmedin. Ahır uzun yaşayış cahayını uzgardırdın. Kamış zorlar ve bir payağın derslerden beni borlarım ve hazırlarım gibi kuş bağlandın. Hatırımdaki manzaralar ya. Seni hiç kim bu yerde zilap toplamaydı. Bu yenge ot koymaydı. Seni burada oktamaydı.
ser o teu cheiro, teu yulbaz, teu dev, e o ricuch, o teu bombom, e a ringaça, e o curso a tu fitia, para o homem vai dar jarda. Se andar com o chato, quando o esclusão, que ele já está fora, o chato, o chato, se ele volta a nida, você se chama de ele. Sen uzak oldurışta. Doğum da yöyde gidi. Doğuş getmek zamanıdır. Doğuş yerde rakor konasıdır. Bu o yarım asırdan kurt geç uzundum. Geçer. Seni kumaya kılı olmadım. Cennetimizin uğurlaştı. Babamız gibi onu koyuştu.
Um, maybe we ask our, our first panelist, uh, Shazad Bashir, who's working on a book whose title is Islamic Pasts and Islamic Futures Conceptual Explorations. That's still the title, yes, yes. which is a, a very suggestive, fascinating title that relates, I think, very much to this idea of, of collective memories. Uh, there's a lot of symbolism in here that's related to Islam, but also pre-Islam, which is a part of Islam, Jahaliyyah. And so maybe you want to comment on, from your perspective, what you see in this Sure. I, I'll comment very briefly, and actually my greater interest would be to ask questions of so to actually, yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's fantastic, and actually it does connect very much to what I'm doing, which is to suggest that in order to, um, the relationship between the future and the past is always ex exceedingly coextensive. The way the past is told almost always has to do with how the future is to be imagined or where, how it, it is uh, wished to be imagined in a way. So in a way, going back to collective memory and actually, and in this way, uh, the way it's done here with this tremendous effect of interlacing the, uh, the human, the animal, and the landscape, which is really truly remarkably done, um, it's precisely this, um, the reflection of the past is intimately connected to the, what is being a commentary on the present, and also then looking towards the future in terms of how the future, even uh, in language, is involved in the, in, the, in the film. Actually, and the other thing that I, I was greatly struck by in this uh, is um, the, um, the indeterminacy of the use of I as to who exactly is speaking. Now, uh, oftentimes um, I teach materials very much like this, so sometimes students um, will say, well, they try to figure out, well, who exactly is speaking? So you have to try to make them st step aside from that. So that's the fact that one cannot tell is precisely the point in terms of, because then language actually ends up creating the parallel to the visual um, imagery and, and music that is going on. So my main question for you was to something that you actually mentioned in your introductory uh, remarks, which was about listening to people's dreams. Um, so I work a lot with people, uh, written uh, expressions of dreams. And one of the hardest things is to read these things which are in language and then try to convey to in, in written dry academic form as to what it is doing. Now you have the privilege to actually dream it again in, in terms of the presenting a visual image. So I wanted to ask uh, if you could say a little bit more about um, like how, when you listen to the dreams, what, what are you looking for? Or what, does, what strikes you as being powerful? And then how do you actually process the verbal description of images, um, whether your own or others, um, into creating a visual? May I intervene quickly and ask you just to move here, and maybe also because this is being filmed for students. And they, they just that's a very wide, um, <laughs> wide question, and it would take very long to answer. But just to look precisely, to looking precisely to this case, it was the fact that I collected the uh, the dreams. And when I wrote them down, so there was tiger, 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 tiger. And uh, then I start remembering, remembering uh, my mother's dreams related to the tiger from my childhood. And suddenly start all making sense together. Then I looked at epic story of Krapkaz of 40 girls. Uh, you know, there is a moment where one of male characters and his twin sister are traveling in the step and there is twin tigers that appear and the woman young woman says to her brother don't touch them they're sacred and he says no because in the story that men men are uh, driven by hunting you know by its nature so he kills the tigers and the moment he kills the tigers the invasion starts from the both sides from the nomadic and also the seventh day like the persian so here I found the, again the confirmation that the, the, the animal is sacred, not only in the dreams, but also in very old epic stories and tales like fairy tales, but also in architecture we have a, a room of uh, worshipping uh, 
actually leave traces of paw, tiger paw, because uh, so they would just go and collect the places. If they would see the traces of tiger paw, they would carry it, and there was a hole in that with the paintings. So there is all these elements that suddenly start coming together. But in this case, the landscape you see is the places that people have dreamt they have seen the tiger. So these are the empty spaces. So um, you see the, the cemetery in Karakal, Pakistan. They still believe that every Friday it comes back. And uh, I guess it's a belief. Uh, but I went there to film that empty cemetery. Then there is a, a river that passes in Tashkent. Uh, strangely, at the end of the 19th century, the population of Tiger went, went very high in Tashkent. So I filmed in Tashkent at the riverbank where it's believed to be seen uh, last in 1924. So basically, I collected the dreams of people and I went to the places that they dreamt about where the tiger appeared. Mm -hmm. And I filmed the empty landscapes. And the text that you hear, it's, uh, because when I was working on the project, I said, well, it's an animal that was so important for our culture, worshipped, sacred, um, but strangely, we never speak about it. But I don't know yet the reason. Either it's still kept as a sacred presence and people keep it for themselves, or it's forgotten. So um, I said, I'm going to write uh, my personal letter from all the research I put, put together and everything I lived together with these dreams and these locations. Because um, another interesting part is that when you speak to people, they make um, unconscious relation to the recent past, which is the uh, arrival of uh, Russian uh, Tsarist uh, presence. So they kind of mix it together, you know, the di disappearance of the animal because they never hunted it. It was sacred while the Russians opened the hunt on the tiger for the skin. It was very expensive. And also um, uh, the irrigation uh, system of the rivers have changed completely. The country became a cotton industry country. So the river start, water start disappearing, reeds start disappearing and the, the famine disappeared together. So when you speak to people, it's very interesting. If you don't make direct questions, but you just go around, they end up there. So there is a sacred animal, there is a spirit that is alive, but not here, but it is related to that part of history that it disappeared. So for this reason, you see the historical moments I found in the archives that are important you know, for the establishment, but more it's related to establishment of the Soviet, uh, Soviet uh, period already. And uh, so I thought, you know, the soul of this animal was never mourned. Mourning? Yeah. Mourned. And uh, this act of this film became for me, well, I'll do it to mourn the soul of the last tiger, which is so important for us. And it's a new discovery for me. And I don't know still where it will take me, you know, if I keep on researching on it. So I see it was more as a, a video of farewell to the last soul of the Turan tiger. But based on the dream of people I collected. Your, your work combines in interesting ways ethnography uh, with art making and, and research. And I'd like to ask Katie to, to also either comment or ask a question because her work, likewise, she's an ethnographer who does uh, remarkable work in, the, in uh, Tajikistan, in the Badakhshan, which is the Pamir Mountains. She's also worked basically across this region that's often called the roof of the world extending from the Himalaya uh, in, across uh, Karakoram uh, into the Pamir. She worked in the dock uh, up in very difficult terrain uh, and is now doing field work in, in um, uh, Badakhshan in eastern Tajikistan. But how do you, how do you um, take this? Do you have any other comment or question? Well, I'm a fan. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for sharing the work. Um, I guess one of the questions I have is how has your work been received in Central Asia? Um, does it ring true to your viewers there? Unfortunately, this work was never screened in Central Asia so far. I'm planning to screen it in November, uh, but more as a film installation that's going to be playing throughout one month mm -hmm. in an art space. Um, 
I mean, when the sound is um, proper, is set, uh, there is an amazing work of the composer who worked on this film, so it fits the gallery space well. Um, her name is Camille Norman. She's uh, she's actually from USA, but now li living in Norway. She is a composer that plays glass harmonica, and uh, the reason that I worked with her is that. Tiger produces uh, infrasounds to hypnotize shortly the the, the prey. Yes, mm -hmm. and the glass harmonica was used by Anton Mesmer for hypnotic uh, psychoanalytic uh, practices. So I said, well, let's do something with Camille. Well, I'm saying that because uh, I don't know how they will react in Central Asia, but I'm looking forward to presenting. Yeah. Sure, not just not just this work, but I was thinking. I mean, it sounds like your one of the themes of your work has been this, you know, as you said, collective memory. And I'm wondering, even in, in earlier work, um, has it uh, resonated? And, and uh, have you seen other artists in your community in, in Central Asia thinking in these terms, thinking in terms of the shared sacred and, and the recuperation of? of it's interesting because I, yes, excuse I, me, can we ask you to use to microphones? Use yeah. Yes. 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 <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, it's interesting because I um, I wouldn't say among the filmmakers, but rather scholars. Yes, I love working with scholars, working on the field, researching, and then uh, musicians. Yes, um, uh, photographers, yes, so, um, but uh, my visual language in cinema, so-called cinema, um, it's, um, I didn't yet find, uh, well, it's, uh, it's received, but um, I don't have a, a community of people that think the same way, but for example, theater, yes, there is a, theater in Tashkent called the Home Theater, it's an independent theater, so they are always they always follow me to show my works there and they have a special audience who is ready for these type of projects. Um, but then again scholars. Other question? No, you can go ahead. Who who uh, would you count among the influences on your visual language and the way you make films? There are many great filmmakers. Um, from Soviet Union, it's uh, Andrei Tarkovsky, of course, Sergei Barajan, of course. Ali Hamraev is an Uzbek filmmaker who really created poetic language of Uzbek cinema in uh, eight, uh, late 70s, 80s. Um, then from the world cinema, I would say Theodor Dreyer, who we were speaking about him today with that. It's a Danish filmmaker. Oh, there are many of them. No, I cannot just. Uh, yeah. And uh, then music. Music was always very important in my life, I guess, to shape my visual language as well. I always think about the sound as an image, of an image as a sound, because I think that it, uh, it's not separated spaces. It's really coexisting. You can think, uh, changing your position from from music to sound and from sound to music, the way it's constructed and the way it talks to your body and to your emotion. If you have something to say otherwise, I'm sure that's Well, Well, now, okay, so uh, we heard that your father, your father is a filmmaker also, and I'm ashamed to say I'm not <laughs> But uh, you said you grew up with film, and um, what did that mean, actually? Were you working on film sets, like when you were six, kind of thing? Or? Yes, I was on the sets quite often, but my parents wanted me to become an economist. <laughs> so I studied the economy for a year, <laughs> which is not bad. <laughs> it helps in life. <laughs> um, yes, and then I just understood, I rebelled, and they said, well, okay, go, go and do your art, and uh, you will not be successful economist probably. So yes, there was definitely support in the family and my brother is a painter so um, I didn't have to make a big effort uh, to choose my profession. Yeah. 
so it was in the family already. Okay, okay, okay. So this is really interesting. My question is, so you're you're this cosmopolitan, you know, in the best sense, artist out of Central Asia. Uh, but you know, I did do some internet surfing and <laughs> time to learn a little bit about you. And you, you have said in interviews that you find your artistic voice in Central Asia, in Uzbekistan, and you really you were brought in, you, you find your inspiration there. So my question is, is, is that, um, was there a turning point in your life when you, when you knew that to be the case? Was it always the case? Is this, uh, how did that rooting really take, take you? I think it's my grandmother. So I grew up with my grandmother. I slept with her in the same room for 21 years old, till 21 years old. And uh, well, she was very religious and uh, she gave me the first uh, religious education and it was very important for her. And I think it also shaped me somehow. Now I was looking and I was like, oh my God, this is such an animistic film. <laughs> she would not be very happy. <laughs> 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 but, um, that was the first step. And then the storytelling. Mm. It's endless storytelling. So every day there were stories, or else she would just keep on telling stories. There was not a single day or a single uh, night before going to sleep that there wouldn't be a story. And I think that oral storytelling has a, has a very strong power of uh, transmission, memory and developing your identity. And uh, you know, sometimes I don't really uh, know whether it's just on a level of uh, tales, stories, smell, touch, you know, that all goes together. And uh, that makes a very deep anchor that you cannot go away. That's, that's my case, yes. <laughs> and it's great that she never spoke about, you know, there was no idea like dividing like Uzbeks, Kazakhs, or Kyrgyz. It was the Central Asia. So um, it was really a way to connect to any, any of the cultures, and she could do it. So I think that, that I'm grateful to her for that. So I have a follow-up on this thing. Um, big, compared to your experience of growing up and thinking about um, post-Soviet period now, how do you feel in terms of uh, how society is today and whether um, children who are in the same age group that you're remembering now, are they hearing the same stories? Are they hearing new stories? Or what's happening today? I think it depends on family and uh, on the experience of elder people in the family, but I really believe in this uh, connection between the generations, no, not straight with parents, but with the grandparents, because maybe because for me it was so important, but there is this amazing chain uh, that's responsibility for a transmission game and uh, culture. Uh, I honestly look at my mother sometimes and I say, well, you should make a little bit of more effort for your grandchildren. She taught a uh, history of Communist Party, and uh, but she, <laughs> she <laughs> so you know, her storytelling starts from there. Mm -hmm. My grandmother's start storytelling started from before. So you know, but yeah, but that's also moving with time, and I'm sure that will create new uh, identities. So flexible, no, it keeps on changing all the time. So uh, I don't think that we can be always attached to the same same type of. Definition and identity. The, the, um, I haven't seen this film since you finished Kirkus, and now looking at it in light of Kirkus, which I hope you'll all come and see on Wednesday, I see so clearly the connection. In fact, I'm pretty sure there are some of the same shots, yes? No? The same places. Same places, but not the same shots, okay. But one of the things that comes through, and that you'll see in Kratos, is this um, very strong, as you said, animistic element. The, at the end, the, the, the poles, the, the three poles with the, the, the um, ribbons wrapped around them, you know, a place of spiritual pilgrimage, and the girls walking around, and then, you know, doing... I mean, it's all mixed together, Islam and, and whatever else you want to call it, local religion. I don't know, what do you, what do you call it? In, 
a religious studies department. What's the, what's the politically correct term for animism these days? Um, I think most of the time the religious studies departments have given up on the notion of religion, because, precisely because of these complications. Uh, exactly as you're saying, it's inseparable. I mean, it would be impossible to find any Islamic context in which animism is somehow not a part of it, whether Central Asia or other, right? So it's, it's actually trying to move away from those categorizations and actually looking at what happens, how stories are told, etc. Yeah, that, that, I, I think that you, you really hit the nail on the head in terms of, you know, the, the kind of context of Kirkus. It, it's, it's storytelling about this place, Uzbekistan, you know, in our sort of imagination of the West, it's one of the stands. Uh, those are Muslim countries, people are Muslims. Uh, you know, we have images of, of Islam all over the place. And yet, when you see this world, when you go inside it, really in deep inside it, the way, the way your films take us and the way Kirkus takes us, you see how rich it is and how diverse it is in terms of the, the symbols, the images, the references, the memories, the, the sounds, the sights, everything else. That's my impression. Well, going back to Kirkus, um, it's, uh, it is connected, as I said, because of the way I uh, approach the subject. But it's also very different because um, in this case I work with live performance yeah. and uh, they are live musicians and they are young girls full of energy and full of um, you know joy and uh, talented and bright just uh, yeah it's uh, it, it has been a new experience for me working with live performance and working with different media um, there is a, a movement on the stage which is like, it's kind of a way of approaching slightly the theatre, but it's not yet, so there is an image, there is a sound, there is a live performance. Um, so all these uh, disciplines, they come together in Kirkus for me as a field of trying to see how these tools can coexist together to tell the same story. And um, for the sound, um, I worked uh, thanks to the uh, Agaka Music Initiative for uh, around 15 years on the field in Central Asia. I think that it also shaped me to revisit my own culture and to get closer to it, especially through the music. And uh, so that background came in um, of working with the traditional music. And uh, I have seven uh, talented girls from Central Asia that are going to join the club because they're just here at this table. They are from 19 to 29 years old and they are really talented. <laughs> Not because they are in my project, but they are. <laughs> and uh, an exciting part of it is also, you know, like uh, as Ted said, uh, they went through education, it's uh, female empowerment, and I really hope, you know, that this project is um, uh, a way for them to be motivated to try new, new boundaries in their art, and uh, also to believe in themselves as individualities, and uh, if there are these seven go and uh, in bring into their community uh, this uh, belief in individual development of women in a society, I think that would make a lot of changes for, for Central Asia. So um, there is that part as well of the project which I find uh, very, very, very important for me. And uh, well, what can I... And more on the project. I think that's uh, well. It will be. There will be more sounds than in this project. There will be more life. There will be more movement. There will be moments to smile. Yes. As they're young girls. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So thank you so very much for this exploration that has put our appetite certainly for Wednesday night but speaking of appetites as the as the smells have wafted through the room we also have dinner so we invite you to uh, fill your plate and uh, have further conversation and this was a very exciting way to take us deeper into the ideas so, sure.